Good morning. Welcome to Highways Lifeline for Tuesday, June 16th. This is our second last lifeline of the season. I just want to thank you for joining us. Have you have you received lots from this study? I have been so blessed just receiving what Paul has done as that great example for us. Going to the different sites, uh, just getting the visuals of where Paul walked and where he spoke and and, and, and longs in my heart one day to go over to the Middle East, to the Holy Land, and, and go on some of those journeys that Paul went on. Well, this morning we are going to go on the boat. Acts chapter 27 is where we're going to pick up today with Paul's journey, the shipwreck, and how God comes through. Now today, some of us might feel like we're in a shipwreck with COVID-19. Some of us might feel that we're kind of on the sidelines, but I wanna encourage you, you're not on the sidelines. As a matter of fact, God is at work in the midst of what, in the midst of COVID-19, God is in, at work. God is at work in your life. So let's just pray and then we're gonna get in our study today. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you that you are moving in our midst. Thank you that you are you are doing so many things for us today. And so, God, be with us today as we as we look at Paul's journey through the shipwreck and how you provided and you took care of him and those on the ship. And so, Father, you will come through for us. Whatever our needs are today, we just lay them at your feet. In your name, amen. Amen. Let's watch the video. This would be Paul's last voyage, and he probably knew it. As I thought about what lay ahead for Paul, this soldier of the cross, a reverence filled my spirit. And I suspected that retracing his final journey from Jerusalem to his last breath in Rome would add to the gravity and respect I was already feeling. For two years, the Apostle Paul had been imprisoned at Caesarea on the coast of Israel awaiting trial. Jewish leaders had accused him of capital crimes against the Roman Empire. Finally, at his hearing, Paul exercised his right as a Roman citizen and appealed his case to the emperor. Paul had often desired to go to Rome. Now he would go, but as a prisoner. I'm in pursuit of Paul, the Apostle. My name is Con Campbell. I've studied Paul's 13 New Testament letters for years. Now I want to know him better. For the first time, I'm following his journeys from Jerusalem across the Mediterranean, all the way to Rome, where he was martyred. Following the route from Caesarea, Israel, I approached the southern coast of what is Turkey today by boat, just as Paul had done 2,000 years ago. The Gospel writer Luke sailed with Paul. Luke would record their adventurous voyage in the book of Acts. At the coastline, I rendezvoused again with professor, guide and author, Dr. Mark Fairchild. We drove a little farther inland toward the ancient port of Myra. Well, when, when Paul writes to Titus, he says, as I left you in Crete, we'll scratch your heads. You know, Acts doesn't mention anything about Crete. Luke doesn't give us as much information as we would hope he would. Yeah. Though he does give us an awful lot, so it shouldn't be too hard on him. Yeah, that's true. That's true. The harbor at Myra was no longer accessible from the coastline. Time had changed the entrance. The port of Myra was important for shipping grain, and from here Paul's voyage would turn dramatic. A replica of a first century boat sat along the dock in front of the ancient granary. Now this doesn't look much like a harbor anymore. What, what's happened to this spot here? What happens is coastlines constantly change because of water. Rivers dump alluvial soil into the harbors, they silt up and it has become a marsh. So what is over here to our left is what remains of the ancient harbor. This would have been the area where the vessels would have come. So we need to imagine water coming up to this point uh, and big enough 
body of water deep enough for a large cargo ship to pull in. And the Apostle Paul stopped here on his way to Rome. Mark, why did he stop here, do you think? In the past, they did not have passenger liners as we have today. Mm -hmm. They're all cargo ships. Uh -huh. And what would happen is they would go to the harbor to try and line up a, uh, a cargo ship, uh -huh. and probably uh, a grain cargo ship that was heading in the right direction. And some of these cargo ships could be 300 feet in length. Oh, so wow. we're not talking about puny little ships. We're talking about large ships. So, yeah. And you need ocean going or sea going craft mm -hmm. um, to weather the storms and the, the waves mm -hmm. and the things that you're going to experience as you go out into the Mediterranean. Right, okay. So we, we need to imagine a large cargo ship to pull in, Paul to get on and take off to Rome. Yes, okay, that's the, uh, the picture. The grain ship had intended to reach Rome before the fall storms, but we know that would not be the case. I climbed on board again with Professor Linford Stutzman, who's led study tours called Sailing Acts since 2004. What sort of impact do you think following Paul around on your boat, what impact has that had on your life? My wife and I say, to each other sometimes it's changed our lives but the, really? it's one thing to to admire Paul from the stories in Acts but to actually experience and, and kind of feel the challenges yeah. and the commitment the level of commitment it took to do these journeys and to do a lot of other things besides travel my admiration of Paul has gone way up I find it fascinating that he has been shipwrecked four times, probably. Really? Uh, why, because, why, why four? Because he, when he writes that he'd been shipwrecked three times, it was before the last oh, time. Right. Probably. Good point, um, good point. But the, the shipwreck story in Acts 27 is the best account of a first century shipwreck in existence is is right? in the Mediterranean. Yeah. So, so historians and archaeologists often refer to Acts 27 because of its accuracy of, and details of what, what had happened. Not only does it describe the wind, the weather, the place, but the tension on board among the people who are desperate. And so, so that, that story is, is one of my favorites to understand the dynamics of sailing under the worst conditions. We didn't try to sail the entire route of this treacherous voyage across the Mediterranean, but I did go to the island nation of Malta, where they shipwrecked, which lies south of Italy and Sicily. Had they missed this island, they would have been driven even farther west toward the north coast of Africa. According to the Book of Acts, it was early morning, first light, when they finally sighted land and ran aground. So I decided to go out early too, in the area of St. Paul's Bay, where many believe the shipwreck occurred. But before reaching Malta, a drama played out that would terrify both the soldiers and the sailors. After changing vessels in Myra, they sailed to the Greek island of Crete. And they had the option of spending the winter there, but the crew decided they would push on, on their way to Rome, against Paul's advice actually. And they were caught in a horrible hurricane. For the next 14 days, they were out of control, being pushed east in a kind of zigzag across the Mediterranean. They were not able to see the sun for this time. They couldn't see the stars. It was a horrible experience. But Paul was able to offer comfort to the crew because he said that in a vision, an angel had appeared to him telling him that he must appear before Caesar and give an account of Christ and in fact all 276 on board the vessel would be spared. In spite of Paul's words, they feared for their lives. Acts chapter 27 describes the shipwreck. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea and in the middle of the night, the sailors thought they were approaching land. Fearing we might run aground in some rocky place, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore if they could. After casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind 
and headed for the beach. But they struck a sandbar and ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable, while the stern began to break up by the pounding of the waves. I tried to imagine the strength needed to swim ashore in rough water after sleepless days and having eaten very little. And we need to remember that Luke survived with Paul. I assume Luke, the historian, was somehow able to keep his parchments dry. And, fortunately, he was something like a physician who could care for the sick and injured. After the shipwreck, all 276 passengers managed to swim safely to shore to the island of Malta, though they didn't know where they were at the time. And some local people from Malta quickly came to help them. And Luke, who writes about this incident in the book of Acts, makes special note of the kindness of the Maltese people and their generosity and hospitality, something that the people of Malta today continue to be proud of 2,000 years later. So they lit a fire in order to warm up these uh, shipwreck survivors and provided them with food and looked after their needs. All right, let's see if this will light. This is how I learned to light a fire as a Boy Scout. This is historically credible. When Paul went to look for some more firewood, he was bitten by a viper. And the local people assumed that he was a murderer or something and that goddess justice was punishing him. But then he showed no ill effects from the bite and they changed their minds and decided that he was a god instead. Suffice to say, word about Paul quickly spread through the island and the chief official of the island named Publius invited him and his fellow travelers to stay with him. And it turns out that his father was unwell with dysentery and Paul healed him. Well, word about Paul now spread right throughout the island and all the sick and unwell of the island flocked to be healed by Paul. What had seemed like a tragic shipwreck for Paul and Luke may have become a blessing. Malta was the only place where Paul had been genuinely welcomed. These three months may have become a season of calm and recovery before Paul would face another kind of storm awaiting him in Rome. Paul has always struck me as a man of action, and he is, but the, the action is punctuated by long periods of being still. So he's shipwrecked in Malta and doesn't leave Malta for three months. And he's been wanting to go to Rome for years. So he, he stays on target through thick and thin. His pursuit of Christ is lived out in the real world with real difficulties and in some ways even though Paul is an extraordinary figure he's an ordinary person as well you know subjected to all these things that normal people are subjected to but his devotion doesn't waver and I suppose for me that that's challenging because I'm sure many people can relate to the sort of scenario if something goes wrong and all of a sudden you lose your focus or all of a sudden everything becomes myopic you know it's just about me and my problems now Paul never does that I mean he counts it as a, a privilege to suffer in that way because that's following Christ and it's actually participating in Christ's sufferings so Paul sees it as a glory and a badge even you know that uh, it's a privilege to be able to do these things to suffer in these ways for Paul and I, I find that you know, very challenging in my own pursuit of Christ. Even though Paul would winter on Malta for only three months, the identity and culture of this island nation is still marked by Paul's time here. And some of those reminders of Paul's presence can be found in Malta's ancient city, Medina. Entering the walled city by carriage took me back in time. Even when I ordered dinner last night, Paul was there to greet me. 
There we are sitting at a restaurant in a hotel, completely secular. On the back flap of the menu in this restaurant is the story of Paul's shipwreck on Malta, lifted straight out of the Book of Acts, including a quotation, a lengthy quotation from the book, and uh, celebrating the significance of that event in Malta. I mean, you'd never see that in a restaurant in Australia or a restaurant in America, but Malta sees itself as being the place where St. Paul was shipwrecked, you know, and his ministry here for three months and his impact here is, is still felt. So, yeah, that was a nice little surprise as I was uh, considering what to eat for dinner, finding Paul on the menu, literally on the menu. Though it is not the only church on Malta named after the Apostle Paul, St. Paul's Cathedral is one of the most impressive. Descending first underground, I was told that this cathedral was built over a 4th century church. It supposedly marked the site where Paul converted Plubius, the chief official of Malta. I was impressed by the fact that part of a 4th century church still remains. The cathedral's main level offered hours of exploration and veneration of Paul. The largest painting on the ceiling captured the moment that made the small island of Malta famous, Paul's shipwreck. Actually, I think Paul would have hated all this attention. For Paul, it's not about Paul. It's about Christ. He considered himself crucified with Christ. Paul was dead, and now only lived as one who serves, hidden as it were, in Christ. Next to the cathedral, a museum displayed a number of paintings portraying Paul. One group of square panels visually retold the story of Paul's life, beginning with the moment of Paul's first encounter with the risen Christ. Of course, the shipwreck is remembered. Even those who hadn't learned to read could easily follow the odyssey of Paul's life to the sad yet triumphant end of his mission. While Paul was on the island of Malta, he still had Rome on his mind. In fact, Paul had written to the believers in Rome several years before his shipwreck, and it's a majestic letter. It was written around about AD 58 while he was in Corinth in preparation of his eventual visit to Rome. And he writes because he doesn't know the church in Rome personally. He knows them by reputation and they know him by reputation, of course. And he's also aware that there are misconceptions about Paul floating around and misconceptions about the message that he proclaims. So he wants to lay out the fundamentals of his message, the gospel that Paul proclaims. It's a majestic letter, it's a wonderful letter, it's Paul's longest letter and his most significant letter. In fact, it's hard to imagine the New Testament without the letter to the Romans. Being on Malta like Paul and passing faces I didn't know made me think. He never saw people as strangers, but he saw them with compassion, as people lost at sea and in need of rescue. And Paul anchored the life-saving truth of the gospel of Jesus in his letter to the Romans. In the first part of Paul's letter to the Romans, he lays out the universal problem that all humanity faces and the universal solution that God provides. The universal problem of humanity is that all human beings have rebelled against their maker. All people, whether Jew or Gentile, have rejected God and deserve to face judgment for the way they've treated their Creator. But then, in the second half of chapter 3, Paul establishes the solution to this problem. God, in His mercy, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, who died as a sacrifice for humanity's sin, for our rebellion against God. And so that anyone who believes in Jesus and in the sacrifice of his life 
for our sin, whether they be Jew or Gentile, anybody who believes in Jesus will receive the forgiveness of sins and will be reconciled to God. Paul comes to mind a lot for me. I mean, I'm a, I guess I'm a, a Paul guy, you know. And so I, I often have his statements in mind. And if I'm thinking about some challenging situation, I'm often thinking, you know, what, how would Paul address this? Or what would he say? Or what has he said about this sort of thing? Well, he says, follow me as I follow Christ in 1 Corinthians 11. I, I feel like I, in a way, have done that. But actually, following in his footsteps and, and thinking hard about what he did and where and with whom, it's actually created a little more distance between me and Paul because I feel like he's just so far beyond me. I'm so struck by his extraordinary nature, boldness in particular. He's so much bolder than me that uh, you know I feel like wow, there's there's actually a lot of room for me to catch up to someone like that. You know, there's a there's a lot of growth to do there, to see that. Yeah. So I'm I'm not Paul, that's for sure. Paul's encounter with the grace and mercy of Jesus completely transformed the rest of his life. In his letter to the Romans, Paul expressed his total confidence in Christ. I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Following Paul's journeys has given me a new perspective of this man his heart and passion. Just 30 yards from the coast of Malta, at the entrance to St. Paul's Bay, sits a small island. It's rocky and barren, except for a statue of Paul the Apostle standing like a lighthouse to be seen by all who pass by. Many debate, is his arm outstretched in welcome or warning? I think he's preaching. That was, after all, his passion. To spread the good news, news that all have fallen short of the goal, but that in Christ we have acceptance. And though I'm nowhere near the bold example of Paul, following him reminds me of that message. I'm accepted no matter what my shortcomings may be.